Today we have our colloquium with Dr. Lucas Rudolph, who will debate the question, when does the public support ambitious climate and environmental policy? Dr. Rudolph is a senior research fellow at the Geschwister Scholl Institute of Political Science, LMU, and a research associate at the Center for Comparative and International Studies of ETH Zurich. His research covers political behavior, preference formation, and the role of institutions from a comparative political economic perspective. He has a scientific interest in environmental politics and environmental behavior. Uh, he's the co-principal investigator of a project funded by the German Foundation for Peace Research, as well as uh, a project with TH Zurich um, and SNF funded on climate risk, land loss, and migration. And Dr. Rudolph received his PhD from LMU and was a visiting fellow at Duke University. He holds a Master's of Political Science, Intercultural Communication and International Law, and a Bachelor's Degree in Economics. Welcome, Dr. Rudolph. Thanks so much, Kalina, for the kind introduction. Um, do you want me to start right away or um, how yes, do please. you usually do this? Yeah, people will um, start They'll continue to come in, and then after your presentation, we'll have the discussion. Awesome. Then I'll share screen. Um, okay. I hope that this works. And I'm just going to finish my setup shortly. Okay, and full screen. All right, do you see a uh, full screen um, yes. right now? Okay, awesome. So um, yeah, thanks so much for the introduction, not much to add. I'm very happy to, uh, to be here and looking forward to um, comments and feedback from, um, from your round, which is, as I understand, a bit interdisciplinary also, which um, uh, is uh, very good because that, um, that question or topic in, in general is very interdisciplinary. So um, I want to present today on um, public support um, on environmental and or um, climate policy, which is on the agenda. I guess you have all um, followed um, the COP27 negotiations in Sharm el Sheikh and well, the more or less dire outcomes, at least with respect to the 1.5 degree goal. And yeah, what to do? We all know that inaction on environmental degradation is uh, associated with tremendous economic costs in the medium to long term, that this is connected uh, with societal risks that we do not really fully understand yet, from health risks to potential um, conflict risk or a mass migration that might ensue. And um, as recently argued by Ross Mittiger, it might even pose a substantive danger for democracy as such. Um, if democracies can't solve the climate challenge, uh, this may undermine their legitimacy and they, as argues Mitiga, uh, might have to resort to authoritative um, uh, means that we do really not, um, not want. So the question then is, how can we within uh, our democratic systems um, ensure that the public supports or at least doesn't hinder ambitious environmental policy on the one hand side and then on the supply um, side, how can we build institutions that are strong and, and further um, this um, uh, demand for environmental policy um, and the interplay of elites or corporate actors and citizens uh, uh, that has to come together for this. I will focus in today's talk on, on the demand side, which is also featuring heavily in my research. And what I will do um, is shortly outline the general um, theoretical puzzle that we um, face here and then bring three concrete examples from my research from different policy fields that we might then um, discuss about. And I'm looking forward to hear your thoughts on these, of course. So um, yeah, the general theoretical puzzle here, of course, is that um, ambitious policy in the environmental realm is rare. And this is particularly so in the international realm as we have seen with COP27. 
But then again, ambitious policies exist. And ambitious, you can think of in the sense of, for example, climate policy achieving um, uh, uh, or being then on track with a 1.5 um, degree goal. And, and you can have various initiatives on, on the subnational level where individual actors, be that citizens, or be that cities, or even, um, uh, even nations have enacted ambitious policy. In general, though, the picture is dire, right? And in general, um, ambitious policy is rare. And the question is why? And um, I think we have a, a dominant theoretical framework here, um, uh, public goods theory and, and the ensuing tragedy of the commons that is very good at explaining why ambitious policy is rare. You have um, adverse um, time preferences of um, especially political actors. If you think about um, electoral cycles that have a four to five year horizon as compared to the climate problem, the 50 to 100 year horizon, right? Um, you have um, um, uh, free riding incentives and all that. And, and this for if, if citizens make up their mind about climate policy, all these adverse incentives, they are relevant both for the ego and, and the sociotropic level, which makes it even more complicated. And, and then the question is how do we get to ambitious policy? Well, and the tragedy of the commons would argue we need smart policy design and then would point to policy design as the, the, the solution um, here. And why? Well, because smart policy design could maybe solve free riding incentives or adverse time preferences and so forth. And I will bring one example that this also works um, at the level of citizens. But what I and, and um, uh, a growing literature argues that we have to maybe look beyond this dominant theoretical framework and, and look to non-economic um, um, uh, incentives and non-economic preferences to really being able to understand when um, ambitious policy comes about and to understand under which conditions yeah, or, or how we can further ambitious um, uh, policy. And well, um, the... Uh, yeah, what the recent literature has looked at here is um, uh, so-called other regarding preferences. So um, preferences, preferences that citizens um, have that do not concern their own well-being, but the well-being of others in, in society or even of um, others um, beyond their society around the globe. And if we can understand under which conditions citizens develop other regarding preferences, um, then we can maybe also understand um, context conditions that allow for ambitious environmental policy. And this is an argument that I tried to trace in, in my recent research, um, and well, which might be, um, which might be uh, promising. Um, so three examples on this. Um, the first, um, within the dominant common goods framework, um, how does smart policy design um, uh, lead to ambitious or could support demand for ambitious environmental policy? And then um, uh, to, um, uh, or one example on other regarding preferences and um, under which conditions they might um, develop. And then one um, example on uh, self-material interests and how they might relate to um, uh, uh, um, policy preference formation. So um, the first um, example is from a recent study that I co-authored with um, uh, Lucas Fesenfeld and Thomas Bernard, both from ETH, um, uh, where we um, investigated um, demand for um, food waste policy or policy aimed at reducing food waste. Why is that relevant? Well, in the context that we are talking about today, it is actually tremendously relevant and we don't really have it on our agenda, I think. And food waste is um, responsible for about 8% of global emissions, um, while at the same time about one third of the food that we have in theory available is wasted. So there is quite a potential to save food and at the same time then um, also emissions. Um, and of course, um, food waste has knock-on effects, not only for um, for the climate, but uh, but also for water and land use, um, or even um, uh, conditions such as so social equality. And the question now is, um, would citizens be willing to support regulation that leads to less food waste? Because, well, um, I think we have seen throughout the last decades that um, that um, um, that um, self-interested companies citizens, whatever, they are not um, able to solve this challenge on their own. 
So under which conditions are citizens able to um, support regulation that does this? And we researched this and the other um, questions that I'm going to present today um, in, a Swiss set, in, in a Swiss setting, um, um, research that is embedded in the Swiss Environmental Panel Study, which um, I co-coordinated. Um, so um, that means that we are talking about a population representative sample of a well-developed society, Switzerland, which stands for other well-developed societies, um, I would argue. And we researched the question in, in a combination of um, conjoint and vignette survey experiments. I'm not sure whether um, the audience is um, familiar with this type of research. Um, maybe you could shortly help me out there, Paulina. Is that something that people are aware um, of, how that works? I think some of them might, but not all of them. Okay, so so basically the, 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 the problem is that if you ask citizens about their opinion in a survey that they might over or understate their support depending on factors such as social desirability or um, the ordering of questions or whatever you name it. So we can't really get at policy preferences easily um, um, by way of just asking people, what do you want? Because, well, yeah, it's easy to just wish for, for some sort of policy. So what we try to do here is that we face um, uh, citizens with, um, um, with, um, with, um, uh, with questionnaires that are experimentally varied. Um, and by drawing on this experimental variation um, of, of questions, we can then tease out um, um, trade-offs um, uh, that citizens make with respect to policy and, and thereby get um, at, um, at their preferences in a more um, in a more robust, um, robust way. And one example of, of these are so-called conjoint experiments. And what you do there is that you ask citizens about one policy, food waste reduction, and whether citizens would support food waste reduction under conditions. And these conditions are defined by so-called um, attributes, um, just here five dimensions that this policy has. And we then experimentally fill um, the, the policy um, that um, we ask citizens about by the levels that you see here um, on, on the right. Um, and citizens then get faced with um, a trade-off of two policies. An example is presented here where you as a survey respondent, you would have to choose between the left-hand or the right-hand side policy, which is experimentally determined and different for each and every respondent that sees that survey. So for example, if you yourself would be answering that survey, you would read, um, read through this policy A and policy B, um, and then decide between uh, a food waste policy that is required by law as opposed to voluntary, that um, has an ambitious aim here on the right or not an ambitious aim here on the left, um, that um, is accompanied by a food price increase here on the right and not so much an increase um, here on the left. And then you decide which policy would you rather like and you rate these policies individually. And we can then, by way of repeatedly asking respondents and experimentally varying each and every um, um, uh, yeah, conjoint screen that, that respondents see, we can then tease out the, the trade-offs that respondents make between these attributes and, and their levels. And what you then get is um, something like this, a coefficient plot, where you can then argue that um, citizens on average prefer a policy that is required by law compared to a policy that is only um, ensuing voluntary uh, measures by um, uh, 10 percentage points less. This is how you would read um, uh, such, such a plot. And the overall takeaway here is that if you design food waste policy, or generally, if you design um, um, uh, environmental policy in a smart way, then you really get majority support by, um, by an average citizen. Um, and what does that mean in that concrete case? Well, citizens would actually be in support of food waste policy that is ambitious, so that um, uh, that wants companies to reduce food waste by uh, around 50%, um, that has uh, many firms participating, um, that has some sort of monitoring and reporting um, uh, requirement for, for companies so that you don't really, you don't have greenwashing, but you have sincere policy enacted. Um, and well, that might, they might even tolerate some price increases of up to 5%. 
um, they might or, or they are against price increases if they become too um, too large. So if we have such a policy design, we get majority support, and that is one core argument um, that ensues from um, from common goods theory. Well, despite free riding incentives, despite address time preferences, if we design policy right, we get majority support. Um, and we see this type of, of result, not only for food waste policy, but also for general climate and policy as other authors have shown. And um, what we also asked here is then, um, how can we increase this um, support even further? And what we did here is a so-called vignette experiment. And what we wanted to check is, well, if we, um, if we communicate, um, so, so the, the underlying question is how can we get people to exhibit other regarding preferences? And um, one way of doing so is setting a strong societal norm and by way of this societal norm, communicating that this is what we should do. We should reduce food waste. And we did this um, in, in the survey by, by way of a vignette experiment. So half the sample reads through um, a, a framing text that has the purpose of bringing um, them into a mindset of there is a societal norm against food waste. Um, and then the other half of, of our um, survey respondents, they don't read anything on that. And then we can compare responses. And if um, citizens read through um, a norms frame that um, Swiss society is strongly backing um, a reduction of, of, of food waste, then what we get in, uh, in, in the Condon experiment is a much stronger response. Um, uh, and citizens are, are much more in favor of um, reducing food waste um, uh, strictly um, after reading through these norms. And again, um, we can um, we can um, see this um, um, these types of results with other um, environmental policy um, as well. For example, this is actually the second example that I'm going to skip. I think um, in the interest of time, because I'm only about to do 25 minutes. I think, but um, a second example where this norms frame also um, very similarly showed a strong response um, for respondents um, is in the case of um, supply chain management. If we want companies to clean up behind them in other countries, regulate them um, to, um, to um, yeah, as, as we've seen with the Lieferkettengesetz um, in Germany and, and discussed in Europe also, to, um, to make sure that production abroad doesn't cause environmental damage, then we also see that such a, um, such a norms framing is strong in, in, in bringing citizens to, um, to um, to support strict policy. Okay, so um, these would be two first, um, um, first um, yeah, outcomes. Policy design is important. Communicating norms can bring citizens to support um, strict environmental policy because of other regarding preferences. And then I wanted to look at a third aspect. Um, and, and that is what is with, with self-interest? Because of course, um, in many instances, citizens have to bear personal costs when, um, when um, uh, under the question, do we want to support or not support um, ambitious environment? And um, one example for this is um, when environmental policy or climate policy leads to um, uh, inequalities and particularly spatial inequalities. Think of the discussion that surrounds a wind turbine placement or new power lines um, to, to bring um, uh, wind power from, uh, from the offshore um, uh, wind parks in the north to, to us here in, in the south. Um, or whatever, whatever policy, um, particularly energy policy that is related to, um, to spatial, um, spatial planning. And, um, and there the question always is, well, citizens might be in favor of such policy in general, but they might not want it in their backyard. And if everyone um, uh, is uh, or has that type of preference structure, then it gets difficult to build these, um, these policies. How can we then solve this? And we wanted to research this question, these um, not in my backyard preference structures. And we did that also in Switzerland by way of um, looking at the 5G antenna network which has, um, uh, I think, um, uh, a similar structure than um, these um, power or wind turbine placement uh, questions. 
Um, and we wanted to investigate here whether these so-called NIMBY effects, whether they would prevent um, uh, ambitious policy um, to, to be rolled out because of um, uh, local costs. Um, and what we did there is we exploited that um, in Switzerland, um, these mobile networks are very quickly built, um, built up while citizens are not yet aware of, of them being built up in their neighborhood. And what we then did is we um, experimentally revealed to um, our survey respondents the location of, um, of uh, mobile antennas just around their house. And sometimes there were none, sometimes there were some. And um, to uh, a third part set of respondents, we revealed um, uh, potential sites. So once that might get an antenna, but, but it's not yet sure whether it will, they will get an antenna. This looks like this. So we have um, for every survey respondent, we have the location of their house. And we also know um, exactly where antennas are or will be built, but respondents don't know yet. And we tell them within the survey experimentally, either nothing, or we tell them where locations of antennas um, actually are or where they will be. And what we then see is that um, if respondents are very proximate to these antennas, um, and we reveal or we give them the information that this um, is going to be the case and um, this proximity, then we see that support for um, uh, the rollout um, of um, uh, the antenna network in, in Switzerland drops. Um, it drops um, relevantly if you are very proximate. And um, uh, then the question was who, who, which, which respondents exhibit this type of, of preference structure, which um, citizens lose um, support for the policy. And, and what we can um, uh, do there is we, we can divide respondents by those that are ex ante rather pro or ex ante rather um, against, um, um, against um, this mobile network. Why did we do that? Well, we wanted to see whether the support drops amongst those that are anyway against the policies then that doesn't matter for majority um, uh, opinion, or whether support drops amongst those that are um, actually before, um, uh, before um, uh, receiving information on, on where antennas are, pro, um, um, uh, pro policy, and then only get against when they see um, the spatial distribution. And that is actually what happens. So um, in, in the upper plot here, you see um, that for those respondents who are ex ante positive towards um, uh, uh, the 5G antenna rollout, so this, this public good, then they show backlash if they are proximate, while those that are ex ante um, uh, negative, they, uh, that are, uh, they are also ex post negative. Support doesn't really change. And this then is, um, uh, is maybe a bit worrying because it, uh, it implies that you lose the support of those that you would need to, to build majority support, actually. Um, lastly, because I'm almost out of, um, out of time, just shortly, um, we then, um, in, in a last step, um, asked, what can we do about this, right? Um, could we somehow solve this? And um, for this, we investigated, if we don't talk about antennas that are actually built, but if we talk about antennas that are potentially built, so what we reveal to respondents is not the actual spatial distribution of, um, of, um, of antenna sites, but the potential distribution of antenna sites. So that uh, the individual is under some sort of a Rawlson, Rawlson veil of ignorance where he or she does not know what the actual cost will be that he or she faces. Um, does that somehow affect the trade-off that, that citizens make? And um, what we see here is that, well, it does. And actually, um, if we only talk about potential sites and not actual sites, then um, our um, survey experimental treatment um, does not really affect preference formation. So this might be a way out of, of this potential dilemma that um, uh, we could um, just have citizens decide about this policy before they know who will become affected in the end just knowing that someone will become a victim. And um, well, that is, um, that is almost um, uh, all for uh, today from my side. So in, in summary, ambitious environmental policy needs the tested support of the public. We know that um, uh, if we don't have this support, political representatives don't really act um, uh, in the direction of um, ambitious environmental and climate policy. How to get the policy on board. Uh, sorry, how to get the public on board. 
smart policy design is important. Um, enhancing other regarding preferences, for example, by um, uh, way of um, strong societal norms and um, addressing um, inequalities. We have talked about spatial inequalities today, but I think in general addressing inequalities that um, will come about um, by the green transformation of societies is, um, is high, highly, um, highly important. And of course, additional factors that we have not discussed today matter as well. The behavior of other societal actors quite prominently, what will corporations do, for example, and um, how, what is the interplay between um, public and, um, and um, uh, state and, and corporate elites, for example. And that's it for today. Thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to feedback and comments.